In this lecture, we are going to begin our investigations of uh, French absolutism in the 17th century, and I think we're going to see a very different path towards political stability uh, when we compare the situation in France and the developments there with those of England that we've just studied. And here you see pictured uh, Louis XIV, who is really the emblem, the epitome of royal absolutism uh, in Europe, and in many ways, um, future monarchs will look to Louis XIV and model their own um, their own crown, their own government on Louis XIV and the things that he did, the things that he built, um, works of art that he had commissioned, uh, etc. So the court life that develops in France under Louis XIV is going to really be the model for uh, court, li uh, court life in other uh, European um, states that we're going to see emerge from Prussia, Austria, and uh, into Russia. So we're going to get started uh, with this. Uh, I hope you're all ready. Um, we're going to go back to this picture, um, somewhat blurry, I'm sorry about that, but uh, this was the picture uh, that you saw on the 30 Years War, Religious Wars quiz. Um, and that's to remind us that the impact of these wars of religion, and in particular the Thirty Years' War, um, serious financial burdens um, for the nations that were involved in these um, conflicts that, again, lasted for 30 years. Uh, and so we're going to see that nations are going to struggle um, to finance these wars and to recover from these wars in particular. Uh, another thing we're going to see is uh, aristocratic unhappiness or dissatisfaction. The nobility uh, in France, Spain in particular, resented the growth of the nation state and the centralizing tendencies that produced ever stronger national governments under ever stronger and more absolute kings. And this really limited the power and the privilege of the great noble families who had for centuries shared in uh, power with uh, monarchs and kings, that is. Uh, and, and so we're going to see that in France and in the absolutist model, uh, the idea of the composite state begins to uh, fade and diminish and is replaced by uh, stronger uh, kings and, and centralizing tendencies that we've talked about when we talked about the new monarchs back in the Renaissance uh, chapter. So we're going to see aristocratic uh, dissatisfaction uh, come uh, into play, uh, especially in France. Uh, we're going to see merchant dissatisfactions. Um, merchants uh, objected to high taxes imposed by uh, these new uh, states and, and kings. Um, the taxes were necessary to pay for wars, and uh, these wars also disrupted uh, trade, and that tended to depress the economies of Europe. So uh, the merchants are going to be uh, somewhat dissatisfied, and we're going to see that that's going to be uh, uh, something to deal with. And then peasant dissatisfaction. Um, the peasants, as we uh, talked about uh, with the Thirty Years' War, were the primary victims of the war. Uh, the destruction of farmlands and villages uh, caused widespread uh, famine. Uh, in addition, large armies marching through areas of Europe brought disease, uh, theft of property, rape, uh, and, and the treatments that uh, you read about, uh, for example, the Swedish treatment, um, caused a great deal of anxiety and distress. So when we talk about um, the 17th century, I think this is sort of the, uh, those four areas will help us keep in mind um, the context with, uh, within which um, the new monarchs, and in particular in France, began to think about how to organize society, the best way to organize society in order to achieve, to achieve stability, uh, unity, um, and I'm not sure peace, but at least stability and unity within uh, the sovereign territories of the nation. So that being said, um, we're going to move forward. Uh, and we're going to have to go back to um, Henry IV, um, remember, um, the good king. So Henry IV was the uh, Protestant prince Henry of Navarre, who by turn of events becomes himself the French king in 1589, renounces his Protestant faith in 1593, uh, uttering, um, at least allegedly so, that Paris uh, is worth a mass. So he converts to Catholicism, issues the Edict of Nantes, and uh, begins a period of uh, stability and peace in France that puts an end to those religious intestinal wars. Um, 
and, and we saw that those wars caused a great deal of suffering. So Henry, um, I think, is called the good king in part because he's able to work out arrangements um, to end those wars. Now, Henry also relied on a chief minister, and we're going to see the appearance of these figures, these ministers, that uh, in many ways are instrumental in helping these absolutist monarchs, or even in England, the constitutional monarchs, uh, um, actually govern their nations. Um, and this is an interesting development that we're going to see uh, continue in European history as we move forward. So Henry, with the assistance of his chief minister, the Duke of Sully, who is pictured there on the bottom, on the left, um, began a program of limiting the power of, no of the nobles. Uh, he ended the religious feuds. And he limited the power also of these regional courts uh, that existed in France, and they were known as the Parlement. Uh, it's not to be confused with Parliament in English, but the Parlement were law courts that existed in um, uh, various regions of France and uh, were able to, in many ways, um, check the power of kings. Um, for example, the Parlement of Paris had to record all royal edicts uh, before they took effect. So uh, Henry the Fourth and Sully are going to work to limit, restrict the power of the nobility and these regional courts, uh, and they begin to do so by building up a, a bureaucracy of servants that work directly for the king. Um, so we're going to see the growth of royal bureaucracy. Uh, and there were lots of people uh, that, that wanted to work directly for the king. They were paid by the king, worked for the state. Uh, and, and again, that's going to really help um, shift the power from local uh, governance to national government governance, um, something that we don't see as much of it in England, as we remarked. Um, so, and, and really, I guess the other thing you can think about, um, people saw these positions within the royal government, and these these bureaucratic positions, as a way to climb the social ladder. Uh, and, and one could work uh, in Paris for the king, or in the provinces for the king, and this was a way to enhance uh, one's uh, social position and earn um, a considerable amount of, of wealth doing it. Uh, so I think that's an important thing. Um, the other thing that King Henry IV began to do was he began to develop France's economy by implementing economic policies aimed at coordinating key economic sectors of production. Uh, and he did this by creating state monopolies in certain industries, gunpowder, mining, uh, salt, to name just a few, uh, were areas, uh, the industries that were actually coordinated and managed by the state. Uh, and this is going to be an important development. Uh, Henry and Sully also began major infrastructure projects, something we hear uh, quite a bit about uh, today in the 21st century, the need to uh, rebuild America through these massive infrastructure projects sponsored or managed by government. Uh, and this is something that they uh, did uh, in France by building a series of canals. And one canal, uh, the Canal du Midi, uh, connected the Atlantic Ocean with the ports in the Mediterranean. Uh, and this was going to facilitate uh, trade, uh, faster trade uh, from Mediterranean areas um, to Atlantic areas. Uh, they also began the construction of new roads across France to make travel and also communication easier and faster. Uh, now, uh, Henry and Sully are also going to force peasants uh, to do much of the labor, and that's going to cause uh, obvious resentment on the part of the peasants. And again, we saw peasant dissatisfaction in the previous slide. Um, Henry, but Henry also uh, reduced the taxes that peasants paid. So on one hand, he's forcing them to work. On the other hand, he reduces the tax burden on them so they get a tax cut or a tax break. Uh, and, and so Henry shows himself to be a, a fairly savvy political uh, ruler. Um, so all of the policies and, and initiatives implemented by Henry uh, the fourth and the Duke of Sully were good for France, and it allowed France to emerge from the dark and divisive religious wars as a strong state with a growing and dynamic economy um, that really allowed France then to begin financing its ambitious and aggressive foreign policy. As we saw, France really uh, sponsors Sweden, finances the Swedish uh, invasions into the Holy Roman Empire during the Thirty Years' War. So, uh, and I think you can see this uh, today uh, with 
with certain nations, the United States uh, first and foremost, but nations like China that have uh, a large cash reserves can use that money uh, in, in foreign policy initiatives to achieve what would, would be good for that nation. So what would be good for the United States? What would be good for China? We see this going on uh, in France at this time. So um, let's, let's just take a look at this. Uh, um, I think the next slide will move on. Uh, and we're going to look at uh, Louis the Thirteenth. Now, uh, remember that um, each uh, each coin has two sides. So in France's case, there was the shiny side, uh, Henry and Sully, and their efforts to um, centralize the state uh, and promote uh, a national economy will be the shiny side. The, the not so shiny side is the uh, assassination of Henry IV, and he's assassinated by a disgruntled uh, Catholic um, who saw Henry's compromises as being bad for France. Uh, the, the idea of allowing religious toleration in France, uh, creating a state within a state. Uh, so the um, this this uh, fanatical Catholic by the name of Ravaillac uh, assassinates Henry in 1610, and Louis XIII then comes to the throne. Um, now Louis XIII led a sheltered life and um, he essentially allows others to govern for him. First and foremost his mother Marie de Medici, another Medici running uh, the affairs of France much like Catherine, uh, and in 1624 Marie de Medici relied on a French cardinal by the name of Richelieu to govern the nation of France and Richelieu was it turns out to be a very effective administrator. It's interesting to note that uh, many of the uh, most effective uh, governors and organizers and administrators actually come from the Catholic Church. So uh, remember the Catholic Church is uh, very hierarchical uh, and, and so Richelieu is able to apply I think some of those lessons that he learned within the Catholic Church's hierarchy um, to the idea of France. And we'll see that also in the writings of um, Bishop Bossuet, who's in your textbook, uh, who writes in defense of absolutist ideas of government. Um, so at this point, uh, Rousselieu is going to pretty much continue the policies of Henry IV. So there's a, a great deal of continuity. Uh, and he did so by reducing the power of the great noble families in France. And he also reduced the, the powers of the local Parlement. Um, he also began to uh, imprison powerful political enemies. And here's something really interesting. He began a series of attacks on Huguenot strongholds. Now, they had been granted the right to uh, worship and to fortify towns by the Edict of Nantes of 1598. But in 1628, Rousselieu had French forces attack the Huguenot of the Huguenot stronghold at La Rochelle, uh, and this really set off a series of anxieties in the Huguenot community, um, and it also drew the English under Charles I into uh, French affairs. Uh, remember that Charles I is a Protestant king uh, with um, divine uh, right aspirations and um, believing in uh, Protestant religious unity, so Charles I is going to intervene on behalf of the Huguenot in England. Uh, setting up a series of, of French and English uh, conflicts for a time. Uh, Richelieu also believed in the idea of overseas exploration and colonization as a way to extend French influence in the world and provide yet more money for France's economy. Um, and lastly, I think this is something you know already, that um, Richelieu pursued a very aggressive anti-Habsburg foreign policy. Uh, both Spain and the Holy Roman Empire uh, bordered uh, France, and uh, it was Richelieu's great plan and ambition to break the Habsburg encirclement, uh, and, and you saw that in the Thirty Years' War. So, uh, let's say that, that France was, uh, uh, Richelieu was successful, um, but France um, really wound up at some point really being kind of broke. Um, that is, um, all of the economic activities uh, were not enough uh, to generate enough wealth to fund wars uh, in the Thirty Years' War, to provide money to Sweden, uh, etc. Uh, and so this is going to lead to greater taxation, which is going to cause greater resentment. And one of the things that Rousselieu and Louis XIII do is they um, manage to avoid calling into session what was in France called the Estates General. Uh, the Estates General, you would recognize 
I think by the title of Parliament, uh, and it was a collection of the three uh, main estates, the nobility, the clergy, and the commoners, uh, the third estate uh, that were merchants and peasants. Um, and the estates, uh, uh, like the Parliament in England, uh, are ancient uh, medieval institution that primarily met um, to represent the interest of the three main social classes in France, but also to approve taxes. And one of the things that Louis and Richelieu do is they avoid calling the estates general. Um, so they're, they're stuck kind of trying to implement and impose new taxes um, by royal will and by royal decree on the people. Um, and that's something that's going to set off a series of, of resentments, if you will. It seems to me that uh, nobody likes paying taxes. Uh, and that's true then, and it's probably true uh, today. Um, now, uh, Louis XIII uh, died in 1638. Uh, Richelieu himself died in 1643, um, and at the time of, of, of Louis XIII's death, though France was um, constantly uh, in a state of bankruptcy or near bankruptcy, it had kind of emerged as the most powerful nation state in Europe. And we're going to see that by 1648, with the defeat of the Habsburgs in the Thirty Years' War, both the Austrian and the Spanish, uh, France is kind of the lone man standing uh, in, in the European international state system. And France would quickly uh, move to consolidate its position within Europe in the 17th and in the 18th centuries. Um, so here we have uh, Louis XIV coming to the throne in 1638, and he's four years old. And this is actually a portrait of Louis as a young boy. And he's a young boy king. And as you know, boys can't be kings. Um, they're not old enough. And so Louis had to rely on uh, somebody else to govern for him, which he does. And again, it's his mother, this time Anne of Austria, uh, who is going to act as regent, but another cardinal of the Catholic Church, this time Cardinal Mazarin, uh, or Mazzarini, uh, an Italian cardinal who came to France. And, and Mazzarini, or Mazarin, was a student of Richelieu's, and he is going to, again, continue the work that was begun by Sully and Henry IV, continued by uh, Richelieu, and Mazarin is going to continue that. However, not before the nobility uh, um, sees an opportunity to sort of strike back at the king and the, at the royal pretensions. Uh, and the nobility is going to rebel in 1648 and try to uh, claw back some of the power that they had lost. And this rebellion goes by the name of the Fronde. Uh, the Fronde in French means simply a slingshot. Shot. So uh, think about a slingshot and what it does, uh, the story of David and Goliath and how uh, uh, David uses a slingshot to defeat Goliath. And you can see the nobility employing this uh, uh, metaphor of a slingshot against these kings uh, that had absolutist uh, pretensions. So the rebellion uh, itself began at the king's court. Um, by a group of imprisoned nobles, and you see an imprisoned noble there on the lower left, uh, who demanded that they uh, be released from prison. They, they felt that the king had arrested them without charge, with no grounds. Uh, and the nobles' cause here was actually taken up by the Parlement of Paris, that is, that regional law court that had been restricted and limited in its uh, impact and effect, but now it's going to, to seize this opportunity. So we have the nobles who are imprisoned, the law court of Paris, Paris, the Parlement, uh, and then the people of Paris are also going to join uh, this movement uh, and the fray. And by 1648-1649, we have great noble families across France uh, and, and the major towns across France uh, rising up in rebellion against uh, the king. Uh, and in 1649, the king uh, sends his greatest general from the Thirty Years' War, the battle-hardened Prince de Condé. Uh, to suppress the rebellion, something he does quite effectively. He puts the rebellion down, restores order to Paris and to France, but then the Prince de Condé does something uh, rather interesting. Uh, he is going to uh, switch sides. So we have the good Prince de Condé crushing the popular uh, uprising, and then we have the bad Prince de Condé switching sides. Uh, and he does so uh, uh, for considerations of self interest. Uh, and again, not the interest of the king and his position, but his own self interest. Uh, and that's going to lead to Paris falling into the hands of the rebels. 
um, that is the nobles and the people of Paris, and Louis himself is actually forced to flee, that is to run away. Uh, and here you see uh, Monty Python in King Arthur, so substitute King Arthur uh, for King Louis, and he flees the royal Paris, uh, palace, which at the time was the Louvre in Paris itself, and it had been the principal royal residence. Uh, and this is going to form a really bitter childhood memory for King Louis. Um, now, at some point, uh, in, in, you know, the Frondeur state, as it became known, uh, existed for about two years, 1651 and 1652, and they ruled in Louis' name, but it was a very inefficient and corrupt government that created hostility and divisions within France. Um, and again, there was a, a, a loss of of unity, uh, there was a loss of stability, and there was a general breakdown. So, uh, and I think the failures of this frontier state can be explained by uh, another uh, a fact, a cultural historical fact, and that is the French had for centuries accepted, had accepted the idea that kings ruling over them was a natural thing, and that it really kind of relates to uh, this idea of the uh, great chain of being that you see pictured here. Um, on the right, and that has, in this case, the Pope and the Church, and then monarch and nobles, knights, vassals, merchants, farmers, craftsmen. You can see that hierarchical order that, that we, we know uh, from previous studies uh, as the great chain of being. And the people of France had, had sort of uh, relied on that uh, to create order, to create stability uh, mentally and in their uh, real world, in their daily lives. And they, th and they saw the failure of the Frondeur uh, state as really uh, having violated the laws uh, of God in some way. So uh, they're, they're, that is, the, the French people are going to bring back uh, King Louis. Uh, Louis and Mazarin uh, are returned to power in 16. 53 by popular demand. And again, we see the ideas and the opinions of the people exercising an important role in the development of history. Now, don't think of this as, as democracy. They, they bring the king back, and, and the king and Mazarin are quickly going to turn on the people as they began to plot the rise of the absolutist state. So yes, the people at key moments and junctures are important, but in France, unlike in England, there's going to be a different outcome. Um, Louis would never forget the humiliation he suffered when the people forced him to flee his own palace, and he determined at that stage that he would never allow himself to be weak and or vulnerable again. And, and for the next eight to nine years, uh, Mazarin really tutored King Louis, who at that point is a, a young man, in the ways of uh, kingship. And by kingship, I mean absolute kingship. So we're going to look at the ideas of Thomas Hobbes, whom you've heard about, uh, and again, this uh, Bishop Bossuet, uh, who, who both write about the idea of a powerful monarch that's really necessary to create order among men. Um, and upon Mazarin's death, in fact, in 1661, Louis began to rule France in his own right without the aid of a chief minister. And he began to perfect the absolute estate begun by his grandfather, Henry IV. And so what we're going to look at now at the end of this lecture are uh, the five rules of royal absolutism. So we have the six problems of royal rule when we looked at the English situation. And here we have the five rules of royal, absolut royal absolutism. Pardon me. And here you see King Louis and his family uh, portrayed as gods in one of the many paintings of Louis that was done uh, during his, his time as king. So the king must be godlike. Uh, the source of royal authority and sovereignty flow from God. The king is God on earth. The king must be in control. Uh, there can't be any restrictions or limitations on the king's power. Not from nobles, uh, not from merchants, not from peasants, and not from uh, parliament, that is law courts. Uh, the king must be wealthy. Uh, the king had to have a steady flow of money uh, to be able to pursue his policies and goals. Uh, and in fact, Richelieu had famously remarked that um, finances are the sinews of the state. The king must enforce religious conformity or uh, uniformity. Uh, national unity, in large part, depended on religious unity. And, and we're going to see that something lo that Louis does later in his reign is to revoke the Edict of Nantes and restore France to a Catholic nation. And the king must have an army that is the arm of the, of the king to enforce his will and to carry out his policies, both internally um, and externally in foreign policy. Um, so that's what we're going to be looking at uh, when we look at uh, absolutism in France. Um, 
And here I think there's just some interesting artistic representations of Louis the Fourteenth as God, uh, and you can see him um, in the upper left as as Jupiter. Uh, you can see the apotheosis of Louis in the upper right. You can see Louis in the lower right as uh, the sun god, the the ancient god of Apollo, uh, and you can see Louis there pictured as another Roman god in the lower left. I'm not sure who that is, but the basic idea is that the classical motifs that we saw in the Renaissance are going to come back. We're going to see art in the service of power. Uh, we're going to see that the art at this time uh, tends to emphasize uh, the glory and majesty and awe of the monarch uh, who is at the very center of everything uh, in, in the court and in France. And we're going to uh, look at this uh, Baroque style of art that tended to emphasize dramatic tension and, and emotional uh, responses in the viewer. So with that, uh, I'll stop this lecture. If you guys have any questions, again, please write them down, bring them to class, and we'll take it up there. Thank you very much.